and uh, a few things coming up here at Christmas time, you know, you'll be well informed of those things that are happening. But one thing this morning and uh, that I want you to keep in mind is uh, that we have a Christmas choir. And after that last song, you're all in. Um, so we rehearse uh, 11 o'clock uh, this Sunday and the following Sunday is up until Christmas Eve. So it's not a huge commitment. And every year, God has just done great things to uh, the choir that's born here at Christmas time. And so we'll sing at the Christmas Eve service. And so I invite you, if you like to sing, you can sing in the shower, if you sing on the way to work, if you sing with the radio, whatever. If you just like to sing, uh, it don't have to be anything that great. Uh, just come and sing. It's amazing what happens when we all come together. That will be 11 o'clock. We'll be right up here around the piano. And I look forward to seeing so many of you. So we turn the page, uh, we turn the page from the book of Acts, and then we did the uh, mission, and then we did the uh, psalm, we had uh, Thanksgiving, and now here we are in Advent once again. So last year I started a series called The Song of the Messiah, and I realized that um, even in a great cultural town like Tala, Iowa, many people don't know what the Messiah is. And when I say what the Messiah is, it's a great oratorio that was written by George Frederick Handel. And people look at me funny now when I say those things because they're unaware. And so, rather than just giving our culture some yogurt, I would challenge you to listen to this beautiful oratorio. It's been a long-held tradition in my house going all the way back to my young childhood. And I was just fascinated with it when I was a child because, first of all, um, it was a two-album set. And there weren't many albums that had two albums in them. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then my mom one day gave me a copy of the book that had all the music and that I could listen to the music and follow along, but which I thought was fascinating. Now, there's a good chance I was quite a geek as a kid, so I took a real liking to it, but you don't have to be that way. Just what it does for us is it follows the scriptural text so well through the Advent season as well as celebrating the birth of Christ. And then, of course, that's part one. And then part two of the Messiah is, of course, those things leading to this uh, Christ's death and resurrection. So this year we're going to finish that up with a few songs from uh, that oratorio. Every week when I send you my email, I'll send you a link. You can listen to it. Uh, the songs that we're going to be doing uh, this particular week, and really that's just to emphasize the text. Well, you can see from the outline that you have this morning, I, I said songs of Messiah too, and then I said celebration and anticipation. You know, when you walk into church this morning, it's beautiful. I mean, it's beautiful to see uh, just the images of Christmas. We put a high emphasis on lights, right? Lights. Jesus is the light of the world. We have the beautiful nativity scene that's up here. And we have the Advent candle. And so each week we'll light a different candle. This week was the candle of hope. It'll take you a long time to figure out how they got that star up there, but that's pretty cool because there was a star that stood over there uh, as led the wise men to the manger. So we have all these different simple things that represent the Christmas story to us. But as I've said every year during this time of year, folks, let's not just look back and remember the manger, but let's look forward. It's like so appropriate that we just sang the song that we sang. Because there's going to come a day when our Lord is going to return. Behold our God. Behold our God. And so until that time, what we do is we continue to preach the gospel. Get that message out there because the time for salvation is now. So when we read through the prophets of the Old Testament, we're going to read a passage from the book of Isaiah this morning. There's, there's a prophecy that points to Jesus, the child who would be born in a manger. And then there's also, it shifts in the gear, and it looks forward to the second coming of Jesus. And what's going to happen there, too. And so literally, here we are today in 2022. We look back 2,000 years and we say, thank you. Thank you, God, for sending your one and only son. But we also stand and say, oh, and come, Lord Jesus, quickly come. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. 
And as you take out your outline, the words will be on the screen, but I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. As we read through this, listen to a few shifts uh, in the passages. Chapter 8, verse 19. When they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the spirits who shirk and mutter, should the people inquire of the God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? So do not instruct in a testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, there will be no God for them. They will wander through the land dejected and hungry. When they are famished, they will become enraged, and looking upward will curse their king and their God. They will look toward the earth and see only distress, darkness, and the gloom of affliction, and they will be driven into thick darkness. Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former time, when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtalah. But in the future he will bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan, and to Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on them living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoiced at harvest time and as they rejoiced when dividing spoil. For you have shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. For every trampling boot of battle and the bloodiest garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child will be born for us. A son will be given for us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be made wonderful, powerful, mighty God, eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast, and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. People of God, this is the word of God. You may be seated. Wow. Disturbing darkness. Do I have to convince you very long and give you examples of the fact that the people out there are walking in darkness? All we need to do is look at the top five news stories from last week, and what we see is an awful lot of darkness. Shooting. Terrible murder. Terrible crimes that are going on throughout the streets of America and in the what's going on internationally. There is great darkness out there. The people are walking in darkness. But to bring it home here a little bit, I wonder how you will respond to this question. Does anything surprise you anymore in the news? One of the greatest shocks that I discovered a few months ago in listening to the news was the growing number of after-school Satan clubs starting and seeking approval in schools across America. Yes, I said that. After-school Satan clubs. Why? Well, the Satanic Temple, which has its headquarters in Salem, Massachusetts, they're seeking to establish these clubs in public schools that have clubs like Good News Clubs or other religious clubs. And they're trying to be there as an alternative for students. Nothing stops them anymore. See, all schools are not accepting them, but they are gaining traction. Apparently, there are those that are unaware of the mission statement of Satan found in the Gospel of 
John chapter 10, where Jesus says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Darkness is out there, folks, and darkness is at our front door, and darkness is coming to our schools in ways that I could never have imagined years ago. See, messing around with these dark forces of Satan will never lead to anything worthwhile. And yet this sort of influence is finding its way into our mainstream culture more and more. So Isaiah, the passage that we started reading this morning, he starts appealing, he speaks of the deep darkness. And the passage began with the fact that there are some people who are consulting mediums and spirits who whisper and mutter. Why can't the dead speak to the living? Simply, they are in agony and hell. The way of darkness is spiritual famine. The way of darkness is spiritual famine and will ultimately lead to the same place, and that is hell. People who are experiencing spiritual famine, they don't know which way to turn. They, they turn to darkness, and that road doesn't end well. Christians must always remember to stay out of these dark places and these dark things that could be very commonplace in our culture today. When you aren't seeking counsel from the Lord, where are you seeking it from? You go to a book. You go to a horse book. You go to a palm tree. I remember a, a woman that uh, had a radical testimony for Christ. I actually hired her to be on our staff. When she told me her testimony, she even reached into her purse and pulled out a card from her former life of which she described herself as a Christian uh, fortune teller. A Christian fortune teller. She said, that's where I was led into deep darkness. And she said, even while I was doing that, I was serving on staff of churches. And then I came to understand what darkness is all about and what light is all about and Jesus Christ is my personal Lord and Savior. There are so many doors to people to take in dark information. And what happens to us when we dabble with things like Isaiah is talking about here, sometimes we can dabble in movies or dabble in TV programs or dabble in reading this or that. It's just like the mouse that continues to dabble chasing the cheese until one day it snaps and cracks its back. So we have to be very careful because what happens is when Christians begin to compromise their faith, it becomes a very serious matter because we must be reminded of this. Satan is real and his demons are real. He's called the Prince of Darkness for a reason. Isaiah points this out and we're living in a society now that is inviting this darkness into the mainstreams of our lives and we must be aware. It's ugly, folks. It's going to get ugly early. And so what we have to talk about as we move into the first week of Advent, we light the whole candle, is what is the remedy for darkness? Well, the remedy for darkness, which takes us now to our text, is always going to be light. How do you get rid of darkness? You shine light into the darkness. And that's what we're called to do. And in the passage, it talks about the lands of Zebulun and Naphtali. So what we need to remember about those things is the study of the Old Testament, of course, God led his people out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and he ultimately led them to the promised land. Well, the twelve sons of Jacob, the twelve tribes of Israel, with a few adjustments for Joseph there, but they each got a plot of land with what we would now refer to as Israel. Basically the same. Well, one of those sons was named Zebulun, and one of those sons was named Naphtali. So when those two nations, or those two uh, tribes, get mentioned, there has to be something significant about that. Because they have been walking so 
walk out in darkness and there would be a light that would come. Well, to tell you where we're at in history is this. Both Naphtali and Zebulun are in an area around the Sea of Galilee in Israel. And they have already been taken away into captivity and dispersed by the Assyrian Empire. So they're gone. When people are left, they're walking in darkness. This area that was once thriving with people is no longer thriving with people. But light is going to come, and that's what Isaiah talks about. He says, light is going to come. But then why is that the only thing to have to light up there? Well, we know that Jesus was born in a little town called Bethlehem. But Jesus didn't stay there. Jesus was born there, but ultimately he ended up in a town by the name of Nazareth. Nazareth, which was not right on the Sea of Galilee, but it was close to the Sea of Galilee. And so that's where he grew up, that's where he learned his father's trade. And then ultimately, that could have been his ministry base. But it didn't become that. It didn't become that, but it is recognized here because Jesus grew up in Nazareth, which is a part of Zebulun. That's why Zebulun is there. Is that there's a light that comes to Zebulun, the same as Jesus. But so when Jesus didn't find his base in, Naz- in, in uh, Nazareth, what he did is he moved up to Capernaum. Capernaum is on the north side of the Sea of Galilee, and almost 80% of Jesus' ministry took place right in that whole area there. And guess where Capernaum was? In the land of Nazareth. And so there was bad news. These two tribes have been taken away by the Assyrians, but there's good news. Because Jesus is going to come. He's going to minister in this area. This is going to be a focal point of the beginning of ministry that is going to change the entire world. That's the light that's going to invade the darkness. This is going to be the counterculture that's still around here in 2022 that turns the world upside down. Because the world would have us go this way, and Jesus says, no, don't go that way, go this way. That's where the light comes into this. And so light invades the world in this way through the ministry of Jesus. But then, what Isaiah moves into, after he talks about Nazareth and Zebulun, we come up with that very, very familiar verse, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And so that's a prophecy right there. And we're sitting here in 2022 and we think, well, we know who that is. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. There's a picture of that. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the birth of Jesus would come sometime later. During turmoil and darkness. And this region was experiencing the turmoil and darkness. They would never be able to find a remedy on their own for the darkness that was going on. And into that darkness comes Jesus. It's beautiful. The Messiah foretold would be born. And what's the significance of Jesus being born? Being born? Actually being born? Well, it is very significant. Because he's 100% man. And it's important that he's 100% man and that he's 100% God. And so he came, born of the Virgin Mary. Birth was given to Jesus. And when we think of Jesus 100% divinity, what we simply need to do is look at John 3 16, which we know so well. For God so loved the world, he gave him one and only Son. Okay? So Father and Son, and of course His Holy Spirit. Jesus is 100% man, 100% human, and 100% 100% divine. God gave His one and only Son, and because He did this, there would be hope for humanity. This is the remedy for darkness. But then there's more. This is where the gears get shifted a little bit. 
Because the next line is, and the government will be on his shoulders. That's in verse 6, the latter part of it. For the government will be on his shoulders. And when I, when, when I see the little silhouette of a baby there, it's kind of hard to imagine that the government is on his shoulders. It doesn't look like a, a, a child that's going to govern. As a matter of fact, we know the story of Jesus when he, when he does take out his public ministry, probably about age 30, 32, somewhere in there, was the government upon his shoulders. Did he govern? Did he march up to Jerusalem and say, lay out the throne, I am going to sit here on this throne of David right now? Well, does it appear that he did that? A matter of fact, we know this if we put the story forward a little bit, that when he came into Jerusalem that week that he was going to die, he came in on a colt. It might have been triumphal in some senses, but it wasn't to go sit on a throne, it was to die. And so now in this prophecy, we have the government will be upon his shoulders. Well, dear people, this prophecy isn't fulfilled yet. This is a prophecy that we sit here. In November of 2022, we say, we're still waiting for this to happen. And so, when we think about the disciples, and remember the many times that the disciples had a difficult time seeing Jesus as the Messiah, because in their mind, this Messiah would come, this Messiah would be strong and mighty, this Messiah would come in and kick out, boot out the Romans, this Messiah would triumphantly go into Jerusalem and reign from the throne, and everything would be good, and they'd live happily ever after. This was the, the Messiah that they were looking for. And this wasn't where Jesus was at in his ministry yet. He wasn't there yet. And so they kept asking about him. A matter of fact, when Jesus threw into the narrative to his disciples, I'm going to die. That actually hurt them. Because they could not comprehend in their mind how this triumphant Messiah, this strong political figure, would be able to do what he needs to do if he died. That's just such a confusion. A matter of fact, at one point, Peter said, No, Lord, you will never die. And what did Jesus then do? He rebuked them. Rebuked them strongly to the point where he said, This is Jesus. Even when Jesus was ascending into heaven, he was getting ready to go up into heaven in Acts chapter 1. And, and, and right then, the disciples were still saying, Would this be the time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? This time? No, it's not the time for you to die. But it's going to come. It's going to come. And so here we are, still waiting for that to come. Which kingdom will be established? His kingdom will be established, and he will sit on the throne of David, and he will reign. And we await that time, even today. So if the birth of Christ is the dawn of God's glory, his second coming is the high noon of God's glory. We have to remember this, folks, that the birth of Christ, Jesus came to die. That was his mission. When he was born in a manger, his mission would be that he would die, he would be buried, and he would rise again from the dead and ultimately ascend into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And from there, he will come back again to judge the living and the dead. That all comes from our Apostle's creed. The second coming of Christ, that's when Christ will reign. Behold our God. The second coming of the Messiah will be welcome to the Christian. And it will be terrifying to those who are not in Christ. And when this happens, when this happens, when Christ comes back, he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful in this context is not an adjective to describe the Counselor. Actually, Wonderful is his name. 
wonderful counselor. He will put down rebellion when he returns, and he will reign on earth with wisdom to rule justly. We will never see a ruler like Jesus as long as we live. But when wonderful counselor comes, we will. He is a counselor because he never needs to seek the advice of humanity. We need to live in the fact that Jesus is better than any other. Our hope is not in Democrat. Our hope is not in Republican. Our hope is not in Green Party. Our hope can only be in Jesus Christ. And there will only be one who will ever rule justly, and it's Jesus who is coming back to do just that. We live in a world where it's too often the priority to hear everyone else's voice. Everyone else's voice. And sometimes in doing that, we never hear this voice. Because we somehow want to make everybody feel validated. So please give me your opinion. I only really want the opinion when it comes to leadership of the church and people who are here. It's the word of God. And we need to be seeking counsel from the wonderful counselor. He will also be mighty God, which is wonderful counselor, wonderful God. For all power has been given to him. He will reign over all this earth from the throne of David. That was promised long ago in what we call the Davidic Covenant. He will reign in strength and have the power to execute his plan. There will be none stronger than him. This is divine power and stronger than anything the world has ever had to offer. Now nations become great because they have powerful military, powerful navies, and they make big bombs, and they have all sorts of artillery with Christ's reigns. That will not be necessary. Because Christ will come and reign as mighty God, we have hope today. And the Messiah will be everlasting Father. And sometimes this can be confusing to us because we think, wait a minute, is it his Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? How can Christ be everlasting Father? Is he going to exchange places with the first person of the Trinity? No, of course not. He will be like the Father in his rule over the world. Think about that. Like a Father in his rule over the world. Say what you will about the person who sits in the seat in Washington, either now or in the past. I have an opportunity to see my day father. But Christ will rule as a father. A matter of fact, when it's literally translated, it means everlasting father is father of eternity. And of course, that comes right from Scripture as well, John 1 3. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. In other words, Jesus has, is eternal. Jesus was there at the time of creation, and in Colossians 1.16, it goes even further. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. This is Jesus, our everlasting Father. And there will be peace, which is why he has given the name Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government, of this government and peace, there will be no end. Folks, we should not expect peace at this time in the history of our world. There will be no peace until Christ comes. There are wars going on right now. There is strife going on right now. Strife in our streets. A total lack of peace. But when Jesus comes and he's reigning on the literal throne of David, we can and will see peace. The millennial kingdom promised for in the book of Revelation will be great. And will this all be accomplished in the zeal of humanity? No. Isaiah makes it clear. Only through the zeal of the Lord Almighty will this be accomplished. This is a fabulous prophecy. This is the remedy for darkness. 
the coming of Jesus to establish his kingdom on earth. He will come again in his great glory. He will not be coming as a child and as a servant to die. He's already died once. He will be coming to reign and to establish his eternal kingdom. And I remind you of this every year. Please don't gain a vision of a baby Jesus. That, but, that's, but that's our God, a baby Jesus. Get a vision of the Revelation 1 Jesus. Because the Revelation 1 Jesus is the Jesus right now who's sitting at the right hand of God. Because sometimes, work with me now, Christians behave with me because they think they have a wicked God. Because they think Jesus is a baby. No! Jesus is powerful. And when you see Jesus in Revelation chapter 1, and you see Jesus described in different places in the book of Revelation, this is who Jesus is. And he is powerful. He is mighty. He is wonderful, powerful. Everlasting Father, mighty God. Prince of peace. This is beautiful. So where do we begin our discussion this morning? The same place where we're going to be closer. The people were walking in darkness. It was a dark time during the time of Isaiah. And he was bringing hope to a people for the coming of Messiah. And he was talking about the Messiah coming not just the first time, but also the second time. The people hearing this prophecy wouldn't be able to fully comprehend this. And here we sit today, and we have the advantage of having the whole Bible in front of us. And so we should see it with great clarity. We get the opportunity to read the book of Revelation, and we can see that there's a thousand year millennium reign on earth, and suddenly we begin to connect the dots with passages like we just read from the book of Isaiah. Are people walking in darkness today? Absolutely. Do they need a great light? Absolutely. Will the light be coming? Yes. But until Christ comes, because when Christ comes, then it's the time of two ways. Until that time, the light shines through us because we have Christ in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the time of salvation is now. People can still turn to Christ and receive salvation. And when Christ establishes millennial reign, it will be his wonderful counsel, our mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. The light of the world will reign from the throne of David just as it was promised many years before. So, what must our response to all of this be? Bring light into the dark world in which we live. Darkness will never be our own. Do you have a difficult work situation? Do you feel like there's darkness in your work situation? Bring light into it. Are you having relational difficulty with someone? Someone who might be very close to you? Family members? Bring light into it. Whatever the darkness is, the only remedy to darkness is light. And yet sometimes Christians, they fight darkness with darkness. And darkness plus darkness equals more darkness. We are called to dispel the darkness with the light of Christ. So let's close with this passage from Philippians chapter 2. Good words for us as we begin Advent. Good words for us as we enter into what people sometimes call such a busy and hectic time. Sometimes I think people talk themselves into having a bad Christmas season. Because it's so busy. Let me give you that's not in the Bible, but it's just simply this. Busyness is a spirit of weakness. What I would challenge you to do is give enough space within this coming season so that there can be an unbelievable amount of new life that can shine through you. Paul's words to the Philippine church do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure 
children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. People of God, you are like a prayer. Father, we have a thank you for your words of Scripture, your words that recognize the darkness of the time that Isaiah gave his prophecy, your words that recognize that there's still darkness in the world of Lord Jesus Christ, overwhelming. War is going on in the world, sex with murders in our streets, things in the minds of people so messed up, what used to be wrong is right, and what's right is wrong. Oh Lord, how do we get through it all? Well, your answer is plain from Scripture. We have a wonderful counselor. We have a mighty God. We have an everlasting Father. We have a sense of peace. And we long for Christ's return. And until then, we are going to wait. And as we wait, we are going to continue to praise you. And as we wait, we are going to continue to pray to you. And as we wait, we are going to continue to receive from you what you have in your word for us. And as we wait, we are going to speak to you. Let this be your life in a very dark world. Help us, Lord. Help us as we seek to see this season be one of 